So the book is a, it's kind of like a retelling of Great Gatsby via social network. <laughs> and I don't usually do like preambles, but since I'm wearing pretentious cheap sunglasses and a straw bowler, I thought, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, so I'm going to start at the beginning where one of the protagonists, uh, younger, going out, his brother taking him out for his birthday to a party in Malibu. I don't know how many of you guys know L.A. Anyone been down to L.A., suffered through that from L.A.? Love it and hate it. Jossie, Jake warned as they sped up Victory Boulevard top down in Jake's flat black CJ7 Jeep from God knows what year. Even though it's your birthday, you know you're going to have to let Santander sit shotgun. Whatever, Joss shouted against the wind and blasting music. Just don't call me Jossie again. Jake laughed then glanced to his left where some girl in another car was waving at him. Her lane stopped and theirs rolled forward. Jake waved goodbye as they sped away. Two cars passing in the night, Joss remarked, wondering where his share of the glorious DNA that Jake had stocked up on was. It was all so easy for him. Jake wooted a few more times then bellowed. We're gonna show you how the 1% live the night, baby brother. The gas stations and taquerias and liquor stores flashed by on either side of Victory Boulevard like runway lights. They were taxiing, preparing to take off out of the gritty San Fernando Valley and fly up over the sparkly canyons, landing in the Disneyland of high school parties. They picked up Santander in a 20-second slowdown and made their ascent through the canyon past houses that looked like they were hanging on for dear life. How does anyone live there? Joss remembered wondering as a kid. He still wondered. The city of Malibu is more or less a fictional place, even though it's real. It exists inside a bubble separated from the golden triangle of Hollywood, L.A., and the San Fernando Valley, populated by a lot of movie and TV execs and some A-list actors. It's almost as if it really is a backlot of some studio where the cameras are always rolling, the place where the rich play out their own version of reality TV. But it's closed-circuit TV, not for the public can't spend too much time there if you're not one of the fortunate ones. Someone's always watching, Joss had once told Anthony, to ensure continuity. And if you hang around too long, they find a way to kick you out. As the three of them headed out the canyon and into the town, a 20-foot burst of flame shot up from the side of the mountain 50 feet ahead. It came out of a long cylinder jutting upward toward the sky, nestled in the hillside where the canyon road begins to descend into the town center of Malibu. It was a place called Rockadine, where they build jets and turbine engines. Joss took a field trip there in fifth grade. Whenever he'd pass it, see the flames shoot up, he'd consider it good luck. A few minutes later, Jake took a hard ride onto Pacific Coast Highway. They headed north, away from the center of town, toward a stretch of super-sized McMansions clustered together on the beach. They were like a group of football players on steroids, bullying the smaller houses around them. And then there they were, Point Doom. Santander said it was Brogan Landing's house, the billionaire media mogul. Mr. Landing, Joss presumed, would not be in attendance. Brogan's son, Proctor, was a senior and the one having the soiree. Normally, Joss wouldn't even have heard of this party, let alone thought about going. But Jake, being the football celebrity that he was, basically got treated like a rock star in the high school party circuit. Gave him a free pass through the socioeconomic border checks that were there to keep the rest of the unwashed masses out. It gave him a, th oh, sorry. Part of Jake couldn't give a shit about it all, but there was another part that envied his brother's access. Should we go by net worth tonight or the hotness index? Santander asked Jake, who only grinned. Both, Jake answered Santander. Bonus points if their boyfriends are actually there. The gates to the Point Doom neighborhood opened up and the CJ7 rolled on through. What about you, little man? Santander asked, turning around to take inventory of Joss. You finally going to carve a notch in that empty belt? Joss had, if it was possible, negative cred. While he was sure Jake had enough to lend him for the night, he feared the elite partygoers would be able to smell mediocrity, <laughs> and it wouldn't take long for them to locate its source. As they entered, Joss noticed that Jake and Santander glide in like royalty. Heads of hot girls lean towards each other, whispers and smiles, tongues on lips. Their eyes moved past Jake and Santander, searching expectantly for the rest of their entourage, and fell with a dull thud on Joss. It was a visible letdown, and the grazing herd quickly averted their gaze as if not to infect themselves. To his credit, Jake tried to make Joss feel a part of it between intervals of 
flirting and taking beer bombs, but there was only so much he could do. It was in Joss's hands, and Joss's hands were in his pockets. So Joss retreated, looking for potential sanctuary from the crowd until it was time to go. The house was big enough to get lost in, but that didn't help Joss. Every room he ended up in eventually got taken over by kids looking for a discreet place to get high or get it on. At one point, he ended up in a room that was actually an aquarium. All four walls made of clear plexiglass with exotic fish that swam around like UFOs in orbit. First, he felt like he'd entered an alien civilization where he was on display, all the fish and bizarre sea creatures staring at him. And it occurred to him that the creatures on the other side of the glass were actually less alien to him than the party goers on the other side of the door. After all, there was no pretense to being a fish, exotic or not. You just swam, fed, and shit. Humans made the simplest things seem so complicated. Deciding to avoid the house altogether, Joss made his way down to the beach, which was also littered with party goers. Girls running drunk and naked into the ocean, egged on by the cat calls from their sodded peers. Games of touch football where the girls running with the ball would eventually, inevitably get tackled and end up at the bottom of a pile of sweaty boys. <laughs> the typical teenage bacchanalia you'd expect from a Malibu party. It was a bonfire that a couple dozen kids were dancing around, singing something unfamiliar, maybe a collegiate fight song that their parents or older siblings had taught them. It reminded Joss of a film he saw in AP History about the youth movements of Berlin in the 1930s. He had to walk down the beach a bit before he found an unpopulated highway between a cluster of high rocks that formed a U-shape opening up toward the ocean. When he settled inside the rocky shelter, the clamor from down the beach melted away. He eased down into the velvety Malibu sand. His phone buzzed for the 10,000th time. It was Anthony messaging to see how it was going. Hope you're doing things you'll be ashamed of in the morning. You deserve it, homie. Joss turned his phone off and looked up at a sky swelling with stars. You don't get a view like this in the San Fernando Valley, he thought. All the stars hide over there. I guess it's only in Malibu or Montana that they feel safe enough to come out. I don't blame them, he murmured. Too much to drink or too much to smoke? A voice startled him from somewhere up on the rocks. Neither, he answered, cursing the fact that he couldn't seem to get away and not caring at this point about putting up a pretext. Just nowhere to hide. Ah, the girl's voice, voice cooed. Right answer. Joss could hear her move down from the high rock she must have been perched on, then drop with a tiny thud onto the sand behind him. He didn't move. He was too exhausted at that point to care what anyone thought. He just wanted to go home. It's like the Hitler, Hitler Youth beats Beach Blanket Bingo over there, the girl deadpanned as she came up behind him and plopped herself down in the sand. Joss tore his gaze away from the starry night trying to get a look at her. That's exactly what I was thinking, he said, taken aback, letting out a breathy laugh. He looked back to get a glimpse of her, but she wasn't close enough to make out in the dark. I take it you're not in their ranks, Joss asked. It's complicated, she paused. I guess you could say I was born behind enemy lines. Aha, uh -huh, Joss replied. Don't aha uh -huh me, she said playfully. It's not my fault, I didn't have a choice. Who does? Amazing, she extended her hand over Joss's chest and he gave an awkward shake. Joss, sounds like both our parents had some issues to work out, she quipped. Yeah, well, at least I wasn't named Chad or Skip. Well, their first choice for me was Ashley, so I consider myself lucky. <laughs> wow, you really did dodge bullet of that one. Thanks, Jocelyn. Girl, I'm from Reseda. You're going to have to do a lot better than that if you want to even scratch the surface of effective dissing. I'm sure once I hit the surface, there wouldn't be much left to scratch. Touche, Malibu Barbie. <laughs> Maisie gave a playful kick to Joss's side, which inadvertently sprayed his face with sand. He jolted up reflexively, spitting out blindly and rubbing at his eyes. Oh my God, I'm so sorry, Maisie apologized. She gently grabbed his hands and pulled them away from his eyes. Don't rub, it makes it worse. You have to look down and blink. Joss resisted stubbornly and then lowered his hands and blinked. It worked and he looked up at her face, hovering inches from his. He could finally see her. Cheekbones gliding into lips, chestnut eyes as big as anything he'd ever seen. Wait, she said softly. Close your eyes again. You still have some sand on your eyelashes. Joss's eyes closed and Maisie's sweet breath blew against his face. His skin rippled. 
the blonde hairs on his arms standing at attention like an orchestra tuning itself before the symphony begins. I'm somewhat of a klutz, I guess, she said, looking at him with eyes so big he felt as if he were being swallowed. He blinked again, blood rushed, pulses of slow, wet current, and everything seemed to float as if gravity forgot what it was. A second, more irresistible wave of warmth passed through him as her hand cradled his cheek and soft fingers made contact with his skin. There was an inch of breath between their lips. Joss could feel it more than see it. And without any warning, there was no distance at all. Just the most tender parts of each other, their bodies pressed together as if they had never been apart. There was no clawing or tearing at each other like you see in the movies. They were swimming in warm water without needing to breathe, effortless. Without thought or warning and without hesitation, the rest of their bodies pressed together, remembering for the first time what they were meant to do. Limbs slowly winding around each other like vines, clothes dissolving, skin pressing together like the pages of a book bound by a common spine. One long sentence filled with the perfect words to tell the story of how it all happened commons that pulled the words apart and then back together again without stopping the flow or hiding what they really meant. It was impossible to tell when they actually fell asleep because they started dreaming when they were still awake. Joss remembered watching the colors of the sky appear across Maisie's naked midriff, the explosion of violet, the crashing of orange, and the promise of yellow. Will you marry me? He asked her half asleep. Someday, she whispered. Thank you.